Welcome to another episode of the G20 Interfaith Forum podcast. My name is Stuart Bird. I'm Mariana Richardson. And we're excited to be here to talk about day two of the conference in Berlin. Uh, we just also finished another episode talking about day one, where there were many great ideas discussed about um, how religious freedom and about um, so much work can be done to help indigenous communities in many different aspects. And so the second day was more focused on specific ideas about being identified on how policy can support group rights, indigenous rights, and religious freedom. In the first session, uh, David Little, who from the Harvard Divinity School, um, brought up three or uh, brought up some important ideas uh, about group rights. Can I just make one quick comment about David Little? Yeah. David Little is 90 years old and he is one of the most pronounced and well-revered voices in this whole space. I mean he is so well known internationally it was a privilege having him there at this conference and I just so enjoyed hearing him speak. So, you know, I would say we are also having these up on our website, the YouTube channel. And so I would encourage you, the, our listeners, to watch David Little's speech. It's, it's there on the YouTube channel, and it truly is masterful. Yes, please, please go watch that. Um, in his talk in this session, he talked about group rights. He talked about how human rights are typically individual, but we must also consider group rights as well. Um, group rights are held, he mentioned that group rights are held collectively, not individually, and they allow self-standing communities of independent members to share cultural, language, and distinctive rights. Uh, he said that similar to religious bodies, group rights may require acceptance. Uh, they hold authority but individual rights remain foundational. He talked about how Judge William Brennan emphasized the distinction between indigenous religion and individual rights. Religion isn't a discrete right, it's actually woven into a communal identity. I really appreciate that comment of his. He spoke on how the Universal, Decl Universal Declaration of Human Rights which was drafted in response to fascism, initially prioritized individual rights. But collective rights are also crucial. Uh, Hitler's, Hitler's regime demonstrated the dangers of ignoring group rights group and group interests. Um, he talked about the importance of carving out a space for communal understanding, which is always grounded in the individual rights. Well, and this interplay between individual rights and communal rights is something that was talked about so much, and I'm hoping that we can explore that even more in this podcast. David Saperstein, who um, was basically the first ambassador for freedom of religion that was um, appointed during President Obama's tenure as President of the United States, he um, pointed that the fact that that ambassadorship was even started shows how important this freedom of religion issue is throughout the world and specifically in the United States. Now, he also talked very much about how um, he is a Jew, he is a rabbi, and how that tradition of being Jewish also helps him understand the importance of religious freedom. He said, preserving culture and heritage raises complex issues. While maintaining community identifies, justifies restricting certain aspects of education, it also applies to those seeking to change religious identity. So this idea of balancing and understanding what we should keep in our religious identity and what does the right of government have to stop some of the things that we must do in our religion? That's something that we need to think about. Um, now, this idea of a military solution, I mean, World War II was brought up, of course, because of 
some of the religious freedom aspects of World War II and some of the concerns that some of those same issues are coming back into our world society once more. And that is a real concern. Then secondly, he talked about a system of rights. And he said in classical Hebrew, the term rights does not exist. Instead, there's a system of obligations or commandments that apply both to individuals and to the entire community. And so you don't have a right to food if you're hungry. The concept of rights exists theoretically, but it isn't fully actualized. So as an individual, you have an obligation to feed the hungry. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily have a right to the food. And it's interesting to think of it that way because it does change the way we would treat other people. Yeah. Where we have an obligation to help them rather than I have a right to have that. So last, they, she, he said, let's explore the concept of repentance. Now he talked about Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement, that we engage in heartfelt prayers seeking forgiveness from God. Interestingly, it's never an indig individual I who confesses. It's always a collective we in terms of the community. We recognize that collective responsibility exists for the sins committed. Now, for me, that's really interesting when we think about religious freedom. We have to also think of it as a community. So we have to say that we have the opportunity, we have the obligation to help other people have freedom of religion. If we flipped the way we look at it, instead of saying, I have the right to freedom of religion. Instead, if I look at other people and say, nope, I have the obligation to make sure that you have the right to be able to worship where, how, or what you may, then that completely changes the way we as a community look at each other. So he says, forgiveness from God and others isn't automatic. It requires making amends with those we've wronged. Restitution and reparation are essential to undo the damage caused. Specifically here, he was talking about some of the damage that's been done to indigenous groups in terms of their religion and how they've been used and how they've been touched and hurt and, and their, their traditions and rights destroyed. He said, religious leaders representing diverse perspectives hold unique potency when expressing common values. So their authentic voices together can also be a real change. So instead of each religion having their own polarized view, what he's saying is all religions should come together with an authentic, one uni unified voice saying that we are going to help other religions have that positive aspect. Wow, that's amazing. And that's the the hope that these events that are held uh, will foster this desire to have peace and collaboration and the idea is that after this event in Billing and others that religious leaders and other leaders will go back to their organizations and start building um, collaborations and like you said everyone coming together. You know there was an interesting question after David Little and David Saperstein both of them spoke and the question was about collective you know, this idea of collectivism versus individual rights. And uh, David gave a really important point. He said, um, the political authority and state church is intertwined. He said, in contexts like the United States, Canada, and Australia, indigenous people hold political authority as sub-states. You know, this idea of reservations. Unlike voluntary religious communities, they cannot easily exit if they disagree with policies. So if I disagree with a, a policy, it's not like they can say, okay, I'm out of here. They're on their reservation. That's, that's their, their sub-state. And then um, he says that there's no easy solution with this. There's, there's no way for us to, to kind of go through this in a positive way. We really have to think about it. And we also have to have that same heart of a culture of peace that we talked about before and start thinking about other people than ourselves. And all of those are the keys that David Saperstein talked about. 
David Little did talk about this 2020 case, which I find fascinating. It's Oklahoma versus Castro Huerta. And what it is, it's this case where tribal groups actually claim over half of Oklahoma based on treaties that were signed in the 1840s. Now, these are legal treaties. And so the Native Americans in that area, they own half the state. Now, what happens if I have a home on that area? <laughs> and this was what the court was bringing up. So the court left the possibility for Congress to alter the situation, resulting in legal ambiguity and a complex implication. So um, this was an example of how complicated this whole thing is of individual rights versus communal rights and you know where does government come in and where does government stop the communal rights because the Native Americans had the communal rights of half of the state of Oklahoma and yet other people are now living there. So what happens in a situation like that? Now, um, the one thing that I would say too, David also brings out, is that the United States just issued a formal apology to the native populations of the United States for the trauma that the boarding schools caused upon their people for generations. And so this discussion that we're having about indigenous people is something that's still very much at home here in the United States and is a conversation, a timely conversation that we need to have. The next session focused on balancing individual and group rights. Uh, and we wanted to talk about Rodrigo Vitorino Souza Alves uh, and, and his talk. So he said that the use of the term minority can be seen as offensive to some people. However, it's important to clarify that the term minority is used for the protection of groups that are vulnerable. This could refer to a group that is a minor minority in a country, uh, or a language minority, or a religious minority. In legal context, the term minority is not offensive. It is not prominent, but there is a need for some kind of protection for these groups. And so uh, I appreciate that, that he brought that up, that it's important to remember that when we say that um, someone belongs to a minority group that um, is not an offense, that's saying that uh, maybe extra measures should be taken to accommodate and to protect and to make sure that their needs are met. And that goes right along with Nick Miller and what he talked about. A matter of fact, a lot of this second day of the conference dealt with the guidelines for assessing the intersection of the rights of indigenous peoples, group rights, and freedom of religion and belief. One of the things that um, Nick brought out, which is really true, is that when the UDHR was first done right after World War II, the thought and feeling for indigenous groups was that they needed to be assimilated into the dominant culture. That instead of them keeping their traditions, their culture, they instead should become a part of the greater culture and leave their old culture behind. Well, that's not what these people want and these minorities want and these in indigenous and African descent religious traditions want. And so because of that, they have kind of said, all right, then let's set up guidelines for countries and also for the United Nations to think about rewriting some of these laws, some of these policies that have truly kind of destroyed the culture of these people. And instead, do something very different in terms of helping them preserve and actually help it thrive in a very positive way. And so basically in this wonderful guideline, realize that this was a draft and we had a, a, a really robust discussion about how to change it, what to add. And these were people that are the indigenous group people that were giving this input, which was really positive and African descent religious groups too, that were talking about what should we add, what should we take out. This should be something that we're going to be bringing to the forum which we'll be talking in later podcasts about. And we're hoping it will be something that we can give internationally so that people can have policy guidelines 
in various state governments that they can look at this and kind of have, uh, you know, some, some place to start to change the law. Some of these things go with freedom of religion, belief, group and individual rights, that um, there needs to be freedom of indigenous religion. And then this idea of education and traditions needs to be preserved through education. And this was something we talked a lot about yesterday in terms of this idea of how to, to help education. The next one was environmental stewardship and sacred sites. And this is to ensure that public, private, and religious entities respect the environmental stewardship responsibilities of the land of indigenous people. So this goes to the idea of the Amazon. So what is your thought? And, and when we talk about this idea of the land, how can we distinguish between the individual rights, rights of a person with the land and the collective rights of the land? Yeah, that that's a very good question and a continuation of the question of balancing individual and group rights. Um, because um, it's it can be seen that groups are given a right over a land, um, but sometimes an individual, um, that may infringe on an individual's right to, to live there and to use the land um, for their purposes. And so that creates a, a complex um, form of interactions and, and uh, it's going to require some real effort to, to find the best way to balance and help make sure everyone can use the land uh, for their needs and that no one, no one's needs are, are infringed. You know, I think that's interesting. I, I thought about July 4th celebration yeah. and the whole idea of fireworks. Now, I live up in the mountains where um, the biggest concern is fire, you know, in terms of fire destroying the mountain, also destroying homes. You know, it can just ruin the entire land. And so because of that, fireworks were not allowed on the mountain. They had to be in very specific areas. Now, some people really had a hard time with that. Some people broke the law because they said, this is my individual right. It's on my property. You know, I have the right to, to do this. You can't tell me no. But it did have communal, you know, problems. If they started a fire, it wouldn't just affect them, but it would affect the entire land of the community. So there is this really strong balance that, that they talk about in terms of policy. Make sure we have that balance. And then individual freedom of religion for indigenous people. And this is the right, the individual right for an indigenous person to also not practice their indigenous you know, rights, that they don't have to be a part of that tradition if they don't want to. And then freedom against internal religious oppression and persecution that also within these communities that there is not any pressure or, you know, if I want to leave, I should have the right to leave. If I want to believe something different, I have the right to believe something different. And then when they talked about relations between sovereign states and indigenous people, here is this idea of the legal rec recognition of rights, that states should provide legal recognition and protection for religious freedoms and collective rights. And then a balancing public and private interests, we've talked a lot about that, balancing collective and individual rights. Um, we also need to foster mutual respect. Now that's a hard one, because how can policy foster mutual respect? Any thoughts on that? That is really hard. That is very hard. Um, if you know, having respect for someone uh, is often something that goes on in the individual mind or is, is very individualized. Uh, so I'm curious to see how in the future um, how policies will be made to do everything with that's possible to ensure that mutual respect um, is is fostered. Well, one of the things that they brought up is the power of education. And so to be able to actually put some of this 
religious freedom, helping under, helping people understand other people's beliefs. You know, this idea of education. So it's not fear. You know, I don't know what you believe. Mm. I've heard these terrible stories. You know, so I fear your beliefs. Instead, it becomes mutual respect. I know and understand what you believe. And because I know and understand what you believe, I respect what you believe. That is so essential. It seems like uh, if less misunderstanding exists, then yeah, less, less prejudice will occur as well. And so this idea of monitoring also, once you put a policy in place, you need to monitor and make sure it's actually implemented. And then finally, in terms of international norms, the main thing here is to have consistency internationally, that as a world, we realize that this is a problem and we work together to find a solution. And then we monitor, you know, throughout the states. And this is already done through the United Nations, through the UDHR. But what they're saying now is that we are expanding the ideas of the UDHR to actually protect and help promote some of these minorities. And I'm using that in the positive sense, like Rodrigo was saying. <laughs> yes. So that is the essence of the guidelines, which um, we are very excited about these. And I think that they truly can make a difference for people who are working in policy spaces, but also as governments look at, okay, how can I deal with these issues of the collective versus the individual? I think it will be a wonderful guideline for people to use. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mariana, for bringing those up. And uh, how exciting that we are working on guidelines to help with such a complex idea. The next key speaker of this session that we want to focus on is President Cole Durham, who is the president of the IF20 organization. And he talked about the question of how the persecution of a group or a community can affect and negatively affect that group and its surroundings uh, in the long run. And he says, in his own words, he says, this can be a profound and difficult question, particularly if you are a part of a community that has suffered from extended persecution or discrimination. And he shared his, the experience of his ancestors. He says, as a great, great, great grandchild of early Mormon settlers in Utah, I am familiar with a pattern of persecution that drove early members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from New York to Ohio, from, Miz from Missouri to Illinois, and ultimately to Utah. Well, and I think that this is a, a really difficult issue because um, it is something that's happening all over the world, and yet this balancing uh, to, to take the claims of communities and say, what can we do as governments to help those claims? But on the other hand, they have to look at the collective whole. And so this idea of the social contract, and that's what he's basing it on. What is the social contract? What is the need? What is the obligation under the social contract? And this, this idea is really important. Um, he even talks about some of the other things that have been talked about. Alexi, his paper, suggests that teaching within that framework is a necessary condition both for the preservation and revitalization of indigenous traditions, as we've already talked about. And so these kinds of things are positive things that governments can do to help preserve these communities, but also help them feel a positive part of their government, the larger whole. So you have the small community, but then you have the larger whole. How do you help that small community feel a part of the larger whole? So there needs to be autonomy but there also has to be a way of helping them feel like they are a part of the country. The next thing that we wanted to talk about just for a moment was Manuel Mores. He is a Baptist pastor, and his talk was more about the people from the forest, particularly the Amazon. And they are, you know, they're in the Amazon region. He said before, you know, the, these are ancestral people who lived individually and collectively. And his concern is, what are we doing in terms of justice for these people? Kind of goes back to Saperstein's talk about, you know, what kind of reparations can we make? What can we do for the future of these 
important people that we need to make sure that they are protected. The, the final thing we wanted to talk about were some final words. For literally a couple of hours, we talked about the guidelines. Almost all afternoon was all about the guidelines. But there are some important final words that were said at this conference. And I know you were going to talk about Nick Miller, so I'll let you kind of share what Nick Miller said at the end of this conference. Nick Miller shared three key ideas in this final words sex session of, of the event. Um, first, he talked about stories he has of different people uh, and his own experiences. Um, these are not just remarkable stories, but moving and heart-touching narratives that he shared. Um, in some insta instances, they are quite sad stories of persecution and disrespect that should not happen to people. So um, for those of you who are listening, we recommend that you go onto our YouTube and listen to Nick Miller's final words uh, and those stories. Second, Nick Miller um, actually apologized uh, for some of the things that his faith has done um, being an, an evangelical Protestant um, and he talked about some things there and some stories and, and made an apology. Uh, his third point is one of hope and this third point focused on um, the idea that we can together make a difference in this world that it's not too late to make real differences, uh, and that as we continue events like these that happen to Beling, and as we continue to just be intentional about our interactions with others and how we're making policies, that there's hope for peace and for a real culture of peace. And I have to admit, having been there, I did feel that at the end, that there truly was that feeling of culture of peace. Catherine Marshall also talked very specifically about the main point of this was also learning from each other, to have a true dialogue, to be able to learn and listen and hear, and then take from that a do, you know, I, a call to action that we need to work together, just like you said, to make a difference. We also hope that maybe we can change the agenda, the world agenda, in terms of as we look at minority populations, whatever those are, whether they're indigenous or African descent religions, religious groups, whatever the minority groups that are, are suffering at the hands of intolerance. And we were talking previously about genocide. These are real things that are happening today. And so what are we going to do to stop those injustices that are happening in the world systems? And then um, we also need to look very specifically about poverty and food. When we talked about this intolerance and the, the problems that these small groups are having, one of the main problems that they're having is that they don't have the education, they don't have the sanitation, they don't have the food that is necessary for them to be able to be successful in the society. So we have an obligation, like David Saperstein <laughs> said, we have an obligation to make sure that they have those to be able to be successful. And then um, it is, this is really important, it is difficult to have women at the table when religion is discussed. And her point here is women have to be at the ta table. That's one thing that also we learned from this Belang conference is that women can have a powerful influence and how important it is when we're having religious discussions that we bring women to the table because oftentimes because of the patriarchy because of the fact that most religions are oftentimes you know organized by men that we need to make sure that women also have a voice in this very important thing finally i just wanted to say ia gilda i just i just fell in love with her enthusiasm about this whole thing and she said um she thanked her ancestors again, but also she also thanked all of us for coming there. 
You know, she said, all too often, you want us to come to you. And this time, you came to us. And I love that idea that we came to listen. We came to learn. We came to dialogue. And that was her blessing. She uh -huh. said, we can hold each other's hands and look to those beside us and move forward. And that's what I hope happens because of the Belang Conference. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing that these events bring together people that wouldn't normally interact on the street on, on, in their daily lives. It's bringing together these these people. And so thank you, Mariana. I'm, I'm glad that you were, because you were able to go to the event, that you're able to bring it here to the podcast to discuss. And that way, that way we can see a little bit of your perspective of the event, how amazing that is. And for those of you who are listening, we encourage you to go to our IF20 uh, website as more documents and press releases will be released on this event. Uh, and we also invite you to go to our social media platforms as well as our YouTube platform to watch and listen to the speaker's addresses. Uh, and again, thank you so much for listening to another episode of the G20 Interfaith Forum podcast. Thank you. The podcast provides information and discussions on the G20 Interfaith Forum, but the views expressed are those of the individuals involved and not necessarily the official stance of the forum. The content is for general informational purposes only and should not be considered professional advice or expert recommendations. Listeners should exercise personal responsibility, seek professional guidance, and conduct further research when making decisions based on the podcast. The information shared may not always reflect the most current developments, and external links or resources are provided for additional information but are not endorsed or controlled by the podcast. By listening to the podcast, listeners acknowledge and accept these disclaimers. Please be aware that the content of this podcast may be subject to copyright. Unauthorized copy, distribution, and reproduction of any part of the podcast is prohibited.